Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we do have scheduled this morning a special uh, discussion topic on the environment. But before I turn the mic over to our presenter, I'd like to uh, provide you with information concerning uh, a few upcoming activities. Uh, this is Dee Miles uh, speaking, and I work with the National uh, Education Commission and the uh, Working Class uh, Project, of which the Working Class Think Tank is an activity. So in terms of uh, upcoming activities on Monday, November 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we the Mental Health for Activists uh, workshop will present a discussion uh, concerning combating and managing depression and anxiety. That is Monday, November 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Mental Health for Activists uh, workshop concerning managing uh, and combating anxiety and depression. On Sunday, November 24th, at 11 a.m. Eastern, we will have a book talk on Viktor uh, Afanasyev's historical materialism. So that is Sunday, November 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern. We will have a book talk on historical materialism, materialism the book uh, written by uh, Viktor uh, Afanasyev or Afanasyev, I've heard both uh, pronunciations. Then on Monday, December 16th, we will have a book talk on Bertel Ullman's Alienation. The title is Alienation, Marxist Conception of Man in Capitalist Society, written by Bertel Ullman. That will be Monday, December 16th at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. And then lastly, please mark your calendar for January and February. We will hold a national online Marxist school of 10 or more uh, classes uh, in a series. And so it should be very interesting with the objective of deepening our uh, understanding of or familiarity with various uh, aspects of Marxist theory and pra practice. So without any uh, further delay, I will turn the mic over to our presenter this morning, Ellen. Uh, thanks so much, Dee. Um, I'll just start maybe by um, introducing myself and the topic a little bit here. So um, as Dee mentioned, my name is Ellen. Um, I am a member of the LA Metro Club, so I'm coming out of the, the Southern California district. Um, and currently, I'm a graduate student at UCLA I'm studying, really studying the environment, but more so how um, people like cultural understandings of the environment uh, through art and literature. Um, in terms of sort of my background in relationship to this topic, which, you know, I really appreciate having the opportunity to to talk about. This is a great passion of mine, and I'm really excited to to talk about this today and also hopefully to hear um, some of the work and some of the, the thoughts that other people have. Um, but I did my undergraduate um, degree in biology and then really I you know, focused at the time on the environment and on ecology and conservation and those kind of topics. Um, then I transitioned a little bit more to the humanities for grad school, but still always with an environmental focus. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. I'll be going over really um, our our own, you know, Communist Party USA environmental strategy and a bit of how we understand the cl climate crisis, especially, you know, um, in contrast to how it's typically, you know, talked about in a more mainstream discourse. And so to, to put this together, you know, I'm bringing in a lot of my own background knowledge, but I'm also relying on some of our key documents like uh, the party program, the road to socialism, as well as some insights from resolution four and also, um, I've been, you know, uh, fortunate enough to read our comrade Mark Bodine's um, great book, Green Strategy, and that also um, provided a lot of inspiration for the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, so to give us kind of a roadmap, I'll start by uh, with a little primer on like what does the mainstream bourgeois democracy discourse about the environment look like? 
then go into how we understand, you know, as Marxists, as communists, the climate crisis um, in all its complexity, and then talk a little bit about our approaches, right? What does our strategy look like? Um, what are the things that will actually, you know, lead to real solutions um, to these issues? And so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, Dee, do you think I should go ahead and, and get started? Absolutely. All righty then. So as I mentioned, um, let's talk a little bit about how the climate crisis is talked about in mainstream discourses in bourgeois democracy. So when the ruling class does acknowledge climate crisis as a reality, I think it's consistently downplayed um, uh, or flattened to only one or two aspects. And there's always a failure to acknowledge the actual root cause, which as we'll discuss in a moment is truly capitalism. Um, and that's always left intact. Um, the role of capitalism never gets the spotlight. At the same time, um, and really with the sort of consensus and maybe conspiracy of corporate media, um, this same discourse tends to pit worker struggles against environmental issues. Um, so for example, that would be like framing sustainable living as this, this lifestyle choice for the wealthy and privileged, um, while at the same time maybe painting industry workers as backwards and standing in the way of progress simply because they want to, you know, continue to have a job. Um, and so that brings us to like the way solutions tend to be framed in this discourse, which really end up being about uh, individual choice and specifically consumer choice, right? The choice to, if you just buy this, I don't know, $80 organic cotton t-shirt, you're doing better, you're, you're helping the environment in some way. Um, and this, there's also so much moral weight put on those um, individual choices, right? That it's virtuous to like consume differently with the environment in mind. And so that, you know, again, turns it into this totally unattainable lifestyle of being sustainable um, that most working people are not ever able to achieve. All while, of course, ignoring that the biggest contributors to the climate crisis are transnational corporations, um, the, you know, ultra wealthy and, um, of course, the military, which we'll get into all of these things a little bit more later. So then, of course, on the other side, in the most reactionary sectors of the ruling class, um, we have a, a sort of a different view of things that tends to trade in, you know, outright denial of the climate crisis um, or really nationalist approaches, conspiracy theories, and of course, it's just like in general anti-science. So some examples of that, you know, we have this old tweet from Donald Trump saying global warming is an expensive hoax. And we also have very recently from the um, vice presidential debate, we had some comments from J.D. Vance to the effect of um, like supposing all of that were true and he was talking about climate change. And then he also, you know, showcased this idea of the nationalism by pointing to dirty countries and dirty economies as if the environmental crisis was caused by some other somewhere else. I think, you know, he likes to specifically point to China, um, which is, you know, ironic because as we'll talk about soon, the US is really one of the greatest contributors um, to the climate crisis. All right, so um, this is another sort of roadmap here. We're gonna talk next about how we understand the climate crisis through our own uh, Marxist lens. So there's three main points I'm gonna discuss here. Number one is why and how capitalism is really the root of the climate crisis um, and how it stands in the way of actually finding any real solutions. Next, we'll discuss how worker struggles are really deeply connected to environmental struggles. They are not in conflict with each other whatsoever. Um, and finally, we'll talk about how the concept of international solidarity is also very linked to an idea of global environmental justice, and that that's also a central part of how we understand the issue. Okay. However, before we get too deep into that, I want to, just for anyone who, who maybe needs it, uh, to give a bit of a summary, actually, of the environmental crisis and talk through some of these terms that maybe people have, have heard before um, but don't have a lot of context for. And my goal here is also to show how multifaceted and complex this uh, set of issues really is. So the centerpiece of the climate crisis and the one that I think gets the most attention is global warming, right? Caused by uh, the buildup of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So to explain how this works, so these gases, um, for example, methane or carbon dioxide are largely produced by industry. Of course, they are produced by our like domestic activities like driving your car, but the biggest producers are industries, whether that's power plants, agriculture, um, different factories, et cetera. 
And so how does the greenhouse effect work, or how do these gases cause global warming? Um, basically, you can imagine our atmosphere like this layer of gases um, on the outside of, our, of the whole like sphere of the globe. And they really act as a shield between us and space, um, between both the, the, you know, space is very cold, so they keep us sort of insulated. And they also protect against solar radiation, um, which is, of course, constantly beaming at the Earth um, from the sun. So this shield does allow solar radiation to enter, which is very important because that both warms our planet and provides the energy that forms the basis of all life processes on Earth. Um, and then every other process based on that. Um, but uh, some of that energy is also excluded by the atmosphere. It literally, you know, imagine like those gases are of course like physical molecules and the radiation is literally like bouncing off of them um, when, when it's encountered. Um, so again, the, the gases uh, in the atmosphere allow some of these rays also to escape because, you know, most of that solar radiation coming in is absorbed by the surface of the Earth, but some of it bounces back and is re-emitted towards space. Usually it's re-emitted at a lower energy, a lower frequency than when it entered. Because it's at a lower frequency, um, it is more easily trapped by that layer of gases, which again, ima imagine it like a shield with holes. You could think of it, about it that way. Um, but the problem is when too many of these specific greenhouse gases build up in the atmosphere, then more and more of that heat ends up being trapped, not able to escape back into space, and then the overall temperature of the Earth increases. So that's basically how global warming works. And of course, you know, the, the conditions on Earth that allow life are really, it's a very narrow set of conditions, right? It's a very delicate balance that we have. So one of the issues caused by global warming, even if we're only talking about a couple of degrees of increase, um, are, for example, extreme heat events that become, you know, incompatible with, with life, or uh, general changes in our weather patterns that lead to more extreme weather events, like, for example, the storms that were just, you know, ripping through uh, the east of the country. So again, that's basically how global warming works, but that is only one aspect of the environmental crisis. And I think, you know, there's all these other issues, which, in my opinion, lately haven't been uh, as present, even in the news or even in environmental discourse, you know, at any sort of um, mainstream level. So some of those things are like the overexploitation of natural resources. So in this image that I have here on the slide, you can see um, an area that's been clear cut. I believe it's been clear cut. The context is that this is for a um, a palm plantation it will be what goes in here next uh, to produce palm oil, um, but you know, in that overexploitation, you also have the destruction of habitats, the degradation of ecosystems. Um, so literally just, you know, taking away the conditions and the things necessary for other, other forms of life to be able to um, survive. And those things are causing actually a max, mass extinction event that we are really in the middle of, um, probably. And then um, we also have the issue of pollution. So pollution on all levels, pollution of the land, of, of waterways, of the ocean, of the air, of our own bodies. You know, you've probably um, heard about things like, you know, they found microplastics in people's brains or in people's uteruses, things like that. You know, it's really um, these toxic substances that we've produced have found their way almost everywhere. We also have, it largely due to um, industrial agriculture, the actual degradation of our topsoil, so making it increasingly difficult to continue to grow food. Um, the overuse of fresh water, and some, in some cases, the salination of water, so water becoming saltier, and that is also linked to agriculture and specifically um, irresponsible irrigation practices and overuse of chemical fertilizers. Um, and then the last point I want to make here is how all of these things are interrelated and make each other worse. Um, so we have this sort of positive feedback loop effect um, where more global warming causes more, you know, destruction of habitat is linked to more pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, moving on. Next, let's really get into how exactly capitalism is the root of the issue and how it stands in the way of real solutions, um, really out of an attempt to preserve itself. So capitalism depends on, you know, it's a, it's a production system that depends on constant growth, on finding new markets to develop um, 
creating new commodities and by that I mean like the literal objects the stuff the junk that you see like in this image um, which is by a, a Dominican artist um, the uh, you know, it's a sort of representation of the Caribbean Sea made out of different sort of brightly colored pieces of, of plastic and metal. So this, you know, drive um, for constant growth is really at odds um, with the fact, you know, that we do in fact live in a, a planet with limited resources. Um, but what we see is that the capitalist class um, prioritize their own short-term profit consistently over long-term sustainability. Um, leading to the kinds of overexploitation that we were just talking about. And it's important to say also that um, the capitalist system exploits the natural world in much the same way that exploits workers, right? There's a, a, a fundamentally, there's this complete um, lack of respect or lack of value placed on life, whether human life or other forms of life. And um, that this creates these very important imbalances that really threaten disaster, whether we're talking socially or environmentally. And of course, um, the last point here is that both the development of capitalism and the dawnings of the environmental crisis are linked to the history of colonialism and imperialism, which we'll talk about more. Um, and so like these were, you know, marked periods of very intense, you know, acceleration of this exploitation of both people and uh, the natural world. That lay the foundations for the global inequalities um, that you know continue to to play out to, to this day and so again capitalism cannot solve these issues um because it's just sort of you know w solving these issues would require um, challenging the very capitalist system itself so um the earth places very real limits and constraints on industrial development and capitalism does not take these limits into account you know i think that there's this sort of grand delusion that we will i don't know mine asteroids or colonize other planets you know constantly find more resources somehow in the world um, or that they'll there will be like quick tech fixes to environmental issues um, however that really is you know, not reflective of of the reality that we live in, and nor would it solve many of the problems, just expand them, really. Uh, we have these limits and we have to work within them. Our task is to do so in a way that's not exploitive and not, you know, in the long run, really, you know, deadly and contrary to the conditions of life. Because there is a real danger that um, this capitalist system of production will destroy the material basis that we need, both for human life and eventually to build socialism. So that's what we're going to keep in mind as we now talk more about our own strategies. So next, um, my point was that, you know, we understand worker struggles as being deeply connected to environmental issues. So um, within this system, you know, capitalism, as I mentioned before, exploits both workers and the environment. And what you have is that also the working class disproportionately feels the impact of environmental degradation. So an example of this is that uh, workers, both in their workplace and at home, um, are disproportionately exposed to like hazardous chemicals, for example. Um, to give specific examples, I don't know if anyone has ever, you know, read uh, the book or maybe I think they made a movie, a documentary as well about the Radium Girls. So these were um, female factory workers in the early 20th century who contracted radiation poisoning because, you know, their job is that they were painting uh, radium dials on what little watch faces. And uh, radium is, of course, a radioactive metal. Um, and they it was used as an ingredient in like a, a self-luminous paint, basically, like a glow-in-the-dark uh, paint. And so those women, you know, who were interacting every day in their workplace with the radium paint um, contracted radiation poisoning, which, if you know anything about it, is absolutely horrible. Um, they were getting cancer. Um, they were, you know, throwing up. They had, you know, literal wounds from the radiation. Um, another example of this is the way that um, poor neighborhoods, and especially in the U.S., um, especially black and indigenous um, like neighborhoods or, or uh, uh, areas with high populations, tend to also be used as dumping grounds for toxic waste or be in close proximity to highly polluting industries. So an example of that, um, and that's what we have an image here on the screen, it would be Cancer Alley in uh, Louisiana. So that's an area where highly polluting industries um, 
are in close proximity to uh, a number of communities and neighborhoods that are predominantly black. And the effect also tends to be that, you know, you have increased rates of cancer and other diseases, um, worse health outcomes, etc. Um, finally, workers are also on the front lines of climate disaster. So a specific example of this would be the way that, you know, agricultural workers, for example, are exposed to really dangerous heat conditions. Um, it may also, you know, be exposed in California, especially to wildfires. Um, there's a, a program in California called the Agricultural Pass Program, um, wherein um, agricultural producers can get exemptions to allow their workers to continue working in even evacuation zones where um, when there's a wildfire, everyone else has been told to leave because it's dangerous, because there's too much wildfire smoke, hazardous conditions. Um, but in order to preserve the, the profit of the, the farm owners, the agricultural like um, uh, capitalists, basically, um, they're allowed to, to have their workers continue working in those conditions. Um, next, um, I want to talk about how capitalists seek also to impose the cost to fix environmental crises onto workers. So what this could look like is like companies trying to um, evade responsibility when they do get sort of like caught in a scandal. So whenever you know you have a company that did cause a major pollution event, sometimes they will declare bankruptcy. Um, to avoid ever having to like pay damages out to to the different claimants. This an example of this was that the company Monsanto, which doesn't actually exist as Monsanto anymore, um, poisoned a whole town in Missouri with dioxin, which is a very toxic chemical. And then shortly after that, they declared bankruptcy. They never paid anyone who was affected, and they just were allowed to basically sort of regroup and continue after that. Um, or, you know. Um, the companies will pass the the costs of environmental regulations onto workers and consumers by, for example, raising prices or lowering wages. So that's how they try to dislocate those costs off of themselves. And the system, of course, allows them to do that most of the time. And then finally, all of these sort of forms of, of oppression of workers are exacerbated and complicated um, by racial, gender, and national inequality, as I think the, the examples I gave really demonstrate pretty well. So all this is to say that the, the environmental movement is, of course, a key element of that broader coalition of the working class um, that's needed to you know, create real uh, revolutionary change. All right, so next um, I'll get into a little bit of, of this you know, history of in, the environment um, in connection with colonialism and imperialism. So to explain you know, why things are um, the way they are, um, we have to look into this history, particularly um, thinking about the, the colonial and imperial powers of the US and of Europe. So here we're talking about you know, the colonization of the New World, um, of parts of Asia and the Pacific Islands, um, being fundamentally, of course, linked to the development of capitalism, right? We had these colonial and imperial powers looking for um, new uh, lands full of workers and resources to exploit. Um, all, of course, to accumulate their own wealth. So this has led to um, unintentional ecological destruction as a sort of byproduct of that exploitation of industry and of agriculture, but also to intentional destruction. So an example of that, um, and what I would call really ecological warfare, would be the extermination of the American bison. So that's the image I have here, a massive pile of uh, American bison skulls in the 19th century in the US. And so this was a specific policy that was carried out um, by the U.S. government, well, that came from the U.S. government, but was carried out really by like settlers during um, westward expansion. The explicit goal was to, you know, exterminate the bison because they provided the material and cultural basis of um, the societies of indigenous people, particularly in the Great Plains region. So it was, you know, part of, of a war against those people to remove the bison. Um, and that this extermination forever then changed the North American landscape, and we're still, you know, feeling its its cascading effects. So again, these lasting effects um, are being felt to this day, um, and one of the sort of results is that um, industrialized nations like the U.S., like countries in Europe, and particularly these former imperial powers, contribute way more to climate change, both in terms of destruction and in terms of carbon emissions 
while the formerly colonized or still colonized nations and people feel the greatest effects. And for anyone who's interested, I would really recommend um, checking out the work of the poet activist Kathy Jetniel Kishner. I have um, her name written down here. She makes um, poems that are very much about this topic, I think, that are really powerful. Okay. Um, so sort of continuing on that theme of war, I want to talk a little bit more about how war and the development of uh, military technology um, affect the environmental crisis. So war destroys the environment, um, and particularly the U.S. military is one of the world's top carbon emitters with um, emissions greater than those of many entire nations. Um, and it's also one of the greatest polluters, <laughs> um, both from from military or from sorry like from regular sort of um, artillery, bombs, et cetera, but also nuclear pollution as well. So a few um, examples, right, um, of how the military and how war fuels um, the environmental crisis. Number one, it, it consumes extraordinary amounts of resources, right, destroys um, habitats, like literally from the, the process of war, from military machines and artillery, um, destroying things like forests, coral reefs, etc. Um, it pollutes and it uh, uses specifically astronomical qual uh, quantities of fuel, jet fuel, etc. Um, and producing, you know, massive amounts of emissions. And it also diverts uh, resources away from, you know, being used, specifically scientific resources, being used to actually like solve issues that we have that would be good for everybody. Instead, you know, that scientific expertise and funding and resources all goes towards inventing uh, military technology. So uh, a specific example would be, um, we can think about the use of Agent Orange, which was a chemical de defoliant um, used extensively by the US in the, the Vietnam War. Um, which has lasting impacts not only on ecosystems, but on people's health, right? To this day, people are born um, with different disabilities um, as a result of the use of Agent Orange that they were, that they or their ancestors were um, exposed to. Okay, we'll continue. All right, so in this next part, I'll talk a bit more about our specific strategy. Um, so there's three elements to this. The first one is the just transition, um, the concept of the just transition. Number two is the peace economy. And then three is um, to talk about uh, how collective action is really the path forward, not individual action or consumer choice. Okay, so speaking of the just transition. So earlier I explained how worker struggles are connected to environmental struggles. So naturally then, um, environmental struggles and worker struggles are both part of that broad, um, sort of broader movement to build a socialist future, which would be ideally just, sustainable, carbon neutral, um, and um, you know actually makes um, significant progress in uh, dealing with our environmental problems. So one example of how this works is that environmental organizations challenge corporate power. So an example of that would be just this past summer, um, a number of different environmental groups, I don't remember all of their names right now, and protested Citibank for its ties to big oil and to polluting industries. Um, and that included both, you know, an argument that there that Citibank is contributing to, you know, financing uh, global warming, basically, but also has these links to industries that, um, you know, cause some of the pollution happening in Cancer Alley, for example. Unions are also a major part of the struggle. Um, so uh, an example of this would be that my the union I'm a part of, which is UAW, um, has been supporting workers at auto plants, you know, to gain for themselves more power um, and particularly to help to organize um, and lay the groundwork for new electric vehicle battery plants to be, you know, run by unions as well. So again, the idea here is that in this transition to clean energy, um, it's a transition that will be just to the workers, right? It's not really helpful if, if we're getting you know, electric cars, but all the workers are really exploited. That's not a just transition. Um, next, um, so linked to that are the ideas of, of also this kind of like transition and support for workers in newly obsolete industries. So for example, you know, in a just transition, the workers from coal mines are not just, you know, fired and left to vent for themselves, but maybe are retrained or given support in some way, given pensions, whatever it may be. 
And finally, of course, within the just transition, there has to be, you know, an acknowledgement of the way that racial, gender, and national inequalities um, uh, play into environmental issues and, of course, workers' issues. And so, you know, um, I think really key to this um, would be like, you know, having conversations about environmental justice and and reparations potentially as part of a, a just transition. And then finally, of course. Um, an element of this is also defending the sovereignty of, of other nations and indigenous peoples and their right to control their own resources and, of course, to have self-determination. Um, so basically, again, in, in this conversation, too, you could revisit the idea of, of more cooperative you know, internationalism and of um, ideas of reparations if we're thinking about the global inequalities related to the environment. All right, so next we'll talk a little bit about the peace economy. So I think um, I you know, made the point about how you know, war and the military are main drivers of um, the climate crisis from, by polluting, by directly destroying um, habitat and ecosystems, by emitting crazy amounts of greenhouse gases, um, and by transferring our, our energy and our resources um, away from social programs or away from actually helpful research and into military technology. So that means that if we are, as our you know party program lays out, massively slashing the military budget and instead using those resources for social programs, for other kinds of research, um, that that goes a long way towards also building a green economy and achieving a, a more sustainable system. So accompanying this would also be, you know, a change in foreign policy and international uh, relations, one that would be based on solidarity and cooperation, uh, especially towards environmental goals, rather than um, intimidation, economic dominance, uh, constant threat of war, etc. And so again, key to that would be that formal respect um, of the sovereignty of other nations and indigenous people over their own resources. Um, and then finally, this peace economy, like I already sort of began to say, um, would mean investing um, not in military research and military technology, but into science that's geared towards addressing actual human needs, um, into climate science itself, um, into, for example, um, research into sustainable food systems or clean energy, um, or um, maybe even some technological fixes like, you know, scrubbing carbon out of the atmosphere or something like that. Um, but um, right now, it's important to note how research is really, uh, how those kinds of research are deprioritized and in some cases actively blocked um, by the corporations that profit off of the status quo, such as oil companies, um, which, you know, directly stand in the way of making progress towards renewable energy, for example. Okay, continuing on. So, True environmental change has to come actually from these very big structural changes in society, and, and those must come about from collective action, mass action, and social decision making. So, um, you know, this would look like, you know, the working class being the main driving force to accomplish all of these changes. Um, and also this means, um, you know, I think there's a way that that environmental discourse tends to like universalize the issue and blame like everyone in the world like we're all contributing to environmental problems but i think this ignores not only existing divisions of class race and gender you know within even the working class the global working class um but also you know shifts blame away from who is really in power and most um interested not only in uh preventing change but in um in you know preventing even even some solutions that could be still compatible with capitalism because they would um, still you know uh, reduce short-term profits. Um, so what this looks like practically, I think, is like you know again blaming working people for not recycling or for um, not taking the you know totally insufficient public transit available to them basically blaming us for contributing to the climate crisis, but not holding those major corporations, the ultra-rich or the military, um, to task for their contributions, or examining um, also the structural barriers that make it really difficult for people to even make those um, sort of individual choices um, more sustainably. So again, what we need is an environmentally conscious socialism, um, where decision-making is truly democratic, 
um, and it's based on the needs of society, not the you know gross accumulation of wealth of the few. Um, and also the needs of the environment that we depend on, again, acknowledging that it has real limits that must be taken into account. And finally, the last point um, is that as we sort of work towards this goal, we have to balance both uh, short-term changes that can be won under capitalism with longer-term uh, goals of these fundamental transformations in our relationship to the natural world. Um, these solutions, you know, will be very complex, just like the climate crisis is complex. There really can be no like magic bullet um, to solve environmental problems. So the main takeaways, um, just to reiterate a few things, is that, you know, as the CPUSA, we understand how the struggles of the working class, including those compounded by special oppression, are deeply intertwine, intertwined um, with environmental issues. Um, that we work towards structural changes through mass collective action and decision making um, of the working class, rejecting any sort of change um, that privileges only individual action and consumer choice. And this also means, you know, um, acknowledging and working with the environmental aspects of all the struggles that we're already in, right? Not like necessarily, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. And finally, we understand the climate crisis as a global issue that requires international solidarity and just action and just collaboration. And of course, that um, you know, I think you know, as as scientific socialists, that our strategy for the climate is also based on climate science, which is continually evolving, and so so must our strategy. Finally, I'd like to propose a number of discussion questions. The first one is, I'd love to hear what environmental work um, you all may be already involved in, in your clubs, um, in your districts, et cetera. Um, I'd like to hear people's thoughts on what is environmentally conscious socialism? What does that mean to you? And how might environmental consciousness lead us to social, socialist consciousness? Um, if people have thoughts or other examples on the connections between the environmental movement and the peace movement, um, and other connections between working class struggle and environmental struggle, and more if anyone has other examples about how do mainstream politicians talk about the environment versus, you know, how do we talk about it? So um, those are just suggestions, of course. Feel free to ask questions about anything, um, and i will be happy to talk about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, we will now open the floor for uh, comments and questions. So I'm looking for raised hands and we will take several comments and questions before we turn the mic back over to um, the presenter. So Ellen, um, I'm speaking to a, a participant now, not the presenter. Ellen, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm Ellen Barnfield. I work for about 40 years with a lot of of peace primarily and more recently also climate organizations. I'm speaking right now of Veterans for Peace and its Climate Crisis and Militarism Project, which is specifically working with 350.org challenging military air shows, which each fighter plane in one hour of buzzing around a crowd and threatening them with terrible noise, terrible pollution, even terribly falling out of the sky, which sometimes they do, uh, uses as much fuel as the average family car does in a year. And they are massive recruiting tools also because the kids have their eyes glowing about how exciting it is to see these fighter planes buzzing around their heads. So there's a whole lot of problems with military air shows and that is the, BFP, CCMP, and 350.org focus these days, as we are only so many, and that's what we do. But it's a piece of it, and we're proud to be doing it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ellen. Molly, we're opening your mic. So thank you so much, Ellen. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about the importance of defeating Trump and MAGA in the environmental movement. Um, I think, you know, in this timing to have this uh, webinar, um, it's important that we um, are clear about uh, about MAGA's role in exacerbating um, environmental disasters. Um, I was recently at an environmental health um, teaching lunch um, and uh, with the with the EPA there and um, state and local officials and community organizations, faith leaders. 
And um, the EPA under Biden administration um, partnered with um, community organizations across the country to supply hundreds of millions well, worth of grants. Um, Cleveland, it, where I'm from, uh, received one of them, $129 million um, to invest in expanding the canopy, tree canopy, um, to reduce pollution, um, solar panels, and to address the crisis of lead poisoning. Um, in Cleveland, one in four in some neighborhoods, children um, are poisoned um, by lead poisoning. And this has uh, impacts um, across the board when it comes to um, mass incarceration, for example, there's a uh, direct link to aggressive behavior and lead poisoning. Um, and so there are um, a, a, a lot more dollars coming in to our, our community for the first time ever um, because of who is in, in federal administration. And so it's um, just one of the things that Trump does is completely gut the EPA. Um, so again, it's really critical that we defeat him um, and all of MAGA on this election. Um, you brought up the agricultural workers and it made me think of the AFL-CIO convention that I went to earlier um, last month. And um, there was the Farm Labor Organizing Committee who passed a resolution there. They've been working with the AFL-CIO to um, allow agricultural workers to unionize. They were left off of the uh, creation of the National Labor Relations Board during Jim Crow um, because of, of systemic racism and, and the Dixiecrats refusing to allow black workers um, to unionize. And they're trying to change that now. Um, so the example that you gave around, um, you know, agricultural workers being forced to work during disasters, that's uh, terrible to hear. And one of the things that will help address that is if they can unionize. Um, and we need to pass the PRO Act. So um, again, uh, everything about MAGA needs to de be defeated to expand um, the environmental movement. Thank you, Molly. And we will take one more uh, question or comment before we turn the mic back over. Uh, Rachel, your mic is open, please. There, there you are. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you guys so much for having these conversations. I really appreciate it. Um, I just recently graduated with a master's of science in medical cannabis sciences and therapeutics and that takes place in the dmv and while i was located in dc i've actually taken advantage of a lot of environmental activism so i participated with extinction rebellion and climate defiance i did stuff with third act and i did a couple of things with 350 um, but that being said while I was doing my master's program, I did a lot of supplemental research on the environmental benefits of the hemp plant. And I think that's an important conversation that we can be including um, when we talk about environmentalism. So for example, uh, per acre, hemp can draw more carbon from the atmosphere than an old growth forest can. Additionally, it can clean up soil. It can, it's more salt tolerant than a lot of other plants. It can, um, produce a lot of healthier alternatives. So you can have, uh, we can make uh, bi biodegradable hemp plastic. We can make hemp creek. We, instead of concrete, um, we can make hemp paper. So we can make paper out of hemp and then um, decrease the amount of deforestation we do for wood pulp paper. And I think one of the craziest things that a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that Hemp has been grown at the Chernobyl site since 1998, specifically to draw out radiation from the soil. And then that hemp is still largely able to produce um, safe hemp products. So hemp textiles, hemp paper, hemp crete instead of concrete. Um, so I just wanted to put plant that seed in, in everybody's minds uh, about that and also quickly say that regardless of who wins the election, we still have a lot of work to do as far as environmental activism goes. Kamala Harris isn't that great either. I'm not saying that you should vote for Trump. I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page as that goes. Again, thank you guys so much um, and I will end it there. Thank you, Rachel. Um, there are a few more hands, uh, Ellen, but maybe you want to take a, a few minutes to respond to the three so far, and then we'll take another round from the audience. Absolutely, that sounds great. Yes, thank you for those um, comments. Wow, people, I think you're all um, engaged in some really excellent work, it sounds like. Um, to sort of maybe just, just go in order for some of my thoughts um, to Ellen's comment. 
um, about the military air shows. Yes, that's such a great example of the absolute like excess of um, military resource use that's justified. You know um, that you can have these you know jets consuming crazy amounts of fuels, basically just you know for a show or for a recruitment tool. Um, uh, meanwhile, you know it's everyday working people that are sort of receiving these messages that they should feel bad about, you know, their consumption. Um, so I think, you know, challenging and, and something like challenging something so specific as an air show, not just like the whole military, I think is a great, um, like really concrete struggle to be involved in. Um, to Molly's comments, absolutely. I think it's, it's you know, cannot be understated the danger that um, Trump and generally the MAGA movement poses. Um, towards making any progress on the environment. You know, we just have to think of of another example like, you know, the entire state of Florida where you have um, MAGA Republicans um, in power throughout most of the state and where um, where environmental discourse at the state level is is actually like actively censored. You know, somebody tell me if, if this is inaccurate information, but I believe that like on, on uh, any kind of like official state documents, you can no longer say climate change um, in Florida. Meanwhile, the, the state is being uh, ravaged by, you know, unprecedented hurricanes um, and other weather events like that and is directly threatened by, you know, rising sea levels. Um, and that's a great connection as well to, to why it's so important to have the PRO Act um, to be able to protect workers from environmental um, problems, you know, from to have a safe workplace, you know, with regards to the environment as well. And of course, um, you know, that isn't to say that, that they're you know, all we have to do is vote in this election. I think we're already all, you know, engaged in these in these struggles and we'll have to continue to be. Because yes, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, there are, you know, significant, you know, like insufficiencies um, in terms of the way Harris talks about it, you know, notably being like pro-fracking um, or sort of like going back and forth on that one as well. Um, that that's also something that we would really have to, to work on um, um, if she, you know, hopefully becomes president. And um, the other example about the the hemp as being potentially you know really um, beneficial um, product and commodity to invest into is a great example of like that's you know the sort of research that we should be prioritizing is putting more resources in developing those kind of sustainable alternatives rather than um, you know investing that in I don't know making more like useless plastic junk or you know developing technologies that don't really improve anyone's quality of life um, particularly military technologies um, but again thank you for those comments and for those really interesting um, examples and points okay we'll take a, a few more comments or questions from the audience and so i'm opening the mic for i think the name is sabiha or sabina there sabiha. you are okay Thank you. Sabina. And okay. so I just have a question about your awareness. Uh, are you aware of the organizing and the um, devastation of a brown and black community in Seattle, Washington, near the Seattle Tacoma Airport and King County uh, International Airport? And they are organizing there and doing some work around exactly what you spoke about the uh, fuel, there's noise pollution there's fuel pollution, and this has been going on. And um, many years ago, I was involved in that, in um, many lies, many from the government, uh, the local government. They had noise monitors. They were supposed to have noise monitors, and they had them turned off. There's a school. They dump um, fuel as they're landing the planes. Um, our county airport is used for private jets for um, Vulcan, which is owned by the late, um, the organization um, of the late uh, Paul Allen, who was one of the richest men in the world. Uh, this is happening and it happens quietly and our local governments um, buy into it. I just wanted to give that as a little bit of information. And you might wanna just look into that and see um, if it's something that you might get some information from or join up with or whatever. It's just another thing happening in another place in Seattle, the Pris what they call the Emerald City, the Pristine. And I don't live far from the airport, so I'm sure I'm impacted by it in some way. But thank you for doing the work you're doing. You're very bright, very young. I'm very old, 
You're very young and very bright. I've done my work and I'm glad to see that you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for more raised hands. Anthony, your mic is open on our end. Please open the mic. There you are, Anthony, speak up. Uh, Ellen, thank you for your presentation. I'm just making a friendly comment to what some another uh, person made earlier about they didn't like Harris, but that does not mean that they have to vote for Trump. Don't forget third parties. Uh, I've been a third party voter since uh, tw the year 2000 regularly. This year uh, in the state of Texas, we had a Green Party candidate and we had a Libertarian Party candidate. Uh, in my judgment, both of those candidates were better than the major parties. I'm just anti the two major parties. So I just wanted to make a friendly comment that just because someone doesn't like Harris, that that absolutely does not mean vote for Trump. It means go third party. That's my friendly comment. Okay. Um, Dan, we're opening your mic on our end. There you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I've been in demonstrations with Third Act, XR, and 350 in Chicago. Um, Jason W. Moore is a geographer. I believe is a Marxist. I tried to understand his writing, but I think I need to sit down with a tutor to understand Marx and nature. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Ellen. It was very informative. Um, I see on another subject, I see foraging as a solution to for food scarcity. It might be necessary to learn this if a, if a emergency comes up and our food supply is is slowed down like in the, during the pandemic. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to Kanya. There you are. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. My my comment question is on number two there about consciousness. Uh, talk about socialist consciousness, and here I would want to find out, first of all, this was a splendid discussion from Comrade Ellen. Well done. I'd like to, uh, you comment a little more or incorporate indigenous knowledge regarding environment. That's very important. As we are aware, the Native Americans are very conscious of the environment and a lot of wealth of knowledge they have, have on this particular issue. I think it should be incorporated into uh, this kind of work. Um, and the, uh, the, the aspect of consciousness also deals with a level of spirituality that uh, uh, we are interconnected with the environment. We are not uh, so much separated or atomized, atomized. So that kind of level of consciousness and socialist consciousness should be also at the centerpiece. Thank you very much. Job well done, Ellen. <laughs> okay, thank you. And lastly, we have Mark. Hi there, thanks. I wanna um, congratulate you on a great summary of a very complex subject. Um, I can't imagine how you did it in quite such a shorter time. I wanted to mention one, other working class environmental issue which is coming to the fore, which is for building trades workers in the Southwest, where temperatures now routinely uh, go to 110, 115 degrees, and they're asking people to do heavy physical labor outside in the middle of that heat. And it's a, a direct threat to human life. And it's at that intersection between workers, unions, the environment, and what the corporations want. Uh, one of the things that I think helps environmental consciousness lead to socialist consciousness is that it doesn't take very long for any environmental movement to run directly into the power of corporations and the, the legal fictions around private property rights. And one of the things that does is unlike where it's just it's this one policy or another policy, when you run into those things, you can draw systematic conclusions about how we need to change the system. It's not just there's this environmental problem or that worker's problem, but it's uh, the system is the problem. Uh, 
The other uh, thing I wanted to mention about um, the, the socialism is that one of the problems that, of constructing socialism is that it has to clean up after capitalism and that this will be a, a big problem because uh, most of the ways we do in industry and agriculture uh, are examples of what's been called the dead hand of the past, where every industrial system is built on the last 100 and 200 years of industrial development. But if we redesign things from the ground floor using our current scientific knowledge, we can make them uh, much more environmentally friendly. However, it requires a big upfront investment, both in the research and in new machinery. So people, corporations don't wanna do that. They uh, avoid that. So we're stuck with these systems that continue to pollute. Um, so lastly, thank you again very much. Excellent presentation. And Ellen, that, uh, that was Mark Brodeen. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for attending. Okay, Ellen, you have the floor for the last time. All righty. Uh, thank you so much again. These are great comments. I'll try to uh, address them all. Um, first of all, to Sabiha, I was not aware of that specific example, um, but I think, yeah, that's, you know, exactly the sort of type of things that I'm talking about where um, absolutely black and brown communities, um, you know, get sort of relegated to these these areas um, where you have increased pollution and then you have so little um, little political will to change that, you know, coming from the top down at least. And so it requires these these massive movements from the bottom up to even begin to address it. So thank you for that example. And I'll be sure to to look more into it. I, I took some notes down. Um, to Anthony's point um, about third party voting, I think, you know, that's that's a much bigger conversation than probably I can address here. But, you know, um, my thought about it is that, you know, as Marxists, we have to look at the realities of our material conditions. And I would say that in this election, this presidential election, um, we are not at a point where, you know, the conditions would allow for a third party candidate to win. Um, and therefore, you know, rather than, than voting for, um, you know, just like for a moral reason or for something else, you know, my, my, my advice um, and my, you know, what I plan to do, um, which I think is sort of in alignment with our greater, you know, party strategy towards this issue will be to vote strategically um, for of the two candidates that can win, which unfortunately is either, you know, Harris or Trump, to vote for the one um, that represents, you know, better conditions for us to continue organizing around these issues in. Um, you know, Trump will add so many things to the long list of troubles that we already have. Um, and, you know, whereas with Harris, we're more looking at, at sort of continuity of things we already have. Um, and 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 actually, you know, some some progress that she is very much willing to make, like we think about, you know, uh, legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act was certainly not enough, but did um, actually take steps, you know, in that direction of, of building greener infrastructure, for example. So I think it's really important to stay focused on on what that collective strategy would mean. Um, to me, to make environmental progress, uh, we need to to you know be trying to elect Harris and working under those conditions. Um, rather than, um, you know, voting third party, which I think would ultimately make it more likely that Trump would win. Um, next to um, to Dan's comments, um, again, it sounds like you're doing really great work, you know, with some of these organizations like Third Act and Extinction Rebellion. And uh, similarly, I feel like I have a lot of reading to do. Um, Marx and Nature is a very compliment, uh, complicated uh, topic, and I'd like to be able to talk more specifically like getting into those theory texts um, and how they they weigh onto this issue um, in terms of um, solutions or things like like foraging i think it's really important um, to we absolutely our food system is, is one of the biggest sort of problems um, not only because right now industrial agriculture contributes to the climate crisis um, but also because these other processes will lead in the future to more food scarcity um, but of course, foraging also becomes more difficult the more of our environment gets destroyed. Um, and we, I would worry also about sort of overtaxing some of those ecosystems. Um, but I think that, you know, there, and this actually goes to Kanye's point that, um, 
if we look at you know indigenous knowledge and indigenous food systems and and how um, those sort of foodways worked sort of for example in North America before uh, colonization, um, we can learn a lot from that about how um, to to have a food system that's much more in balance um, with the the natural processes um, in the ecosystems that we inhabit rather than you know um, industrial uh, monocropping and things like that which tend to to degrade the environment over time you know we can think about food systems that are instead um, adding to and building and increasing biodiversity um, in the environment and then um, thank you also for your for your comments Kanya I definitely agree that there um, not only do we need to to look to other you know sources of of knowledge including indigenous knowledge um, to help confront these issues that yes we should consider the um, the spiritual aspects um, to the struggle as I mentioned earlier in my presentation there's a way that you know capitalism just has absolutely no respect fundamentally for life whether that's human life or otherwise um, and that there's this tendency within capitalism to transform everything even you know human beings even animals and plants into just you know dead matter to be instrumentalized to be consumed etc and I think that you know that's an attitude um, that puts us really you know in peril of making some of the same um, mistakes regarding the environment that we need to think of, of perhaps another way of relating to not only you know other living things but even you know the um, the you know natural resources thinking of them maybe as um, less as there for our exploitation but more as you know part of um, a system that we need to live among as you know one of many sort of creatures um, I hope that kind of made sense and then finally um, thank you so much um, Mark for attending I, I really enjoyed uh, reading your book um, and it was certainly a big inspiration I, I drew a lot of insights from there and yes the example of the the buildings trades workers is a great one you know in some of these areas exactly as you were saying you know we we face these extreme heat conditions and um, workers are expected just to to keep going I think it was in Texas also recently um, back to agricultural workers where they were, I were either politicians were trying or they had succeeded in like making it not mandatory basically for um, agricultural workers to get like water breaks or have shade available to them as they're working in extreme heat conditions. Um, so it's very clear that, you know, to specifically um, move towards environmental justice, uh, workers struggles are, are a huge part of that. Um, and yes, point very well taken that part of what, um, you know, prevents now um, capitalists, big major corporations from making switches that would probably be better and more sustainable for them in the long run is that it takes that sort of massive upfront um, investment, which is a huge deterrent, which is why, of course, it would take, you know, um, decision making, social decision making that's not based on profit to actually implement some of those changes. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you everyone for these really rich comments. Um, I think I learned a lot from hearing from all of you and I hope um, that you learned something from listening to me as well. But thank you everyone. All right, thank you Ellen for the presentation today. Thank you everyone for participating. We hope uh, to see uh, everyone again at uh, some of our upcoming activities. Um, Thank you again, Ellen, and everyone have a good day and see what you can do to make a contribution to the working class effort to uh, move the democracy forward rather than backward. So thank you again. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. <laughs>